Hi, John McRoy here talking all things automotive. Say, is climate change real or not? Look, I'm not here to argue one side or the other, but I do know a way to get everyone interested in fighting climate change, even if they believe it's a hoax. And it's all about making money by cutting your carbon footprint. Most governments around the world are publicly committed to reducing carbon dioxide emissions. They've been haranguing over the details ever since the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, which led to the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, or the so-called breakthrough in Bonn in 2001, or the 2007 Bali Action Plan, or the 2009 Copenhagen Accord, or the 2018 Paris Agreement. You get the picture. Lots of talk, not a lot of action. The problem with these summits is there's too many cooks. Every country wants to tell the others what to do. They argue all the way up until the last day. Then to get a consensus, they sign a watered down agreement that few countries follow. And so CO2 emissions continue to go up. The other problem is that the cleanup effort is thrown on the back of industry, especially the auto industry. Automakers face the heaviest CO2 regulations, even though in the US, according to the EPA, cars and light trucks only account for about 13% of all greenhouse gas emissions. As I like to say, what about the other 87%? Attacking only 13% of the problem is not going to get the problem solved. But what would happen if people all over the world suddenly discovered they could make money by buying more efficient cars? What would happen if they found that they could get a check for reducing their CO2 emissions? Well, you know what would happen. People would become laser focused on fighting climate change, even if they were climate change deniers. So how do we make this happen? There's actually a great historical precedent of what to do and how to do it. Back in the 1980s, there was a deep concern in the US about acid rain, which did a lot of damage. Lakes lost fish because the water became too acidic. Forests were losing trees. Cars parked at shipping ports and on dealer lots had acid eating into the paint. The acid came from sulfur dioxide, SO2, which came from burning huge amounts of coal to generate electricity. It's nasty stuff. Environmentalists wanted strict regulations to force the utilities to clean up their smokestacks. The utilities wanted nothing of that. The Reagan administration, which was in office at the time, demanded a market-based approach. And so environmentalists and free market advocates got together and hammered out a new way to do it. Back then, they called it emissions trading. Today, it's known as cap and trade. Here's how it worked. Instead of forcing utilities to install scrubbers and pollution equipment, the EPA set a cap on how many tons of SO2 they could admit that year. If a utility got its emissions below the cap, it was given credits that it could sell to the utilities above the cap. And as long as the utilities above the cap bought those credits, the EPA allowed them to put out higher levels of SO2. But then, the next year, the EPA lowered the cap on how many tons of SO2 the utilities could emit. So they either had to buy more credits, which drove up the price of the credits, or they had to install scrubbers to reduce their emissions. And every year, the EPA lowered the cap a little bit more. Some utilities found it cheaper to immediately install pollution equipment, get below the cap, and sell their credits to help pay for that equipment. Others, usually older utilities, found it cheaper to postpone installing pollution equipment and buy the credits instead. But since the cap was lowered each year, Ultimately, they all had to reduce their SO2 emissions. What appealed to the utilities was it gave them greater time and flexibility to choose how, when, and where they would cut their SO2 emissions instead of being dictated to. So what happened? Well, you don't hear about acid rain anymore, do you? That's because within a decade, the U.S. cut its SO2 emissions by 94%, with nearly a peep of protest out of any of the utilities. Cap and trade works so well that it's been proposed as a way to cut CO2 emissions. But in today's crazy mixed up polarized world, political conservatives, the very ones who insisted on using cap and trade in the 1980s, are now opposed to it. And environmentalists, the very ones who opposed it back then, are now for it. But let's set politics aside for the moment and think about expanding cap and trade to include 
individual citizens, not just corporations or utilities. Imagine a market mechanism that gives you a CO2 credit for buying a more efficient car. Let's say that you were driving a V8-powered SUV that emitted five tons of CO2 a year and replaced it with a hybrid CUV that only emits one ton a year. You would get a credit for four tons of CO2, which you could then sell in the cap-and-trade market. And you'd get those credits every year that you owned the vehicle. Plug-ins and EVs would get even more credits. Right now, CO2 is trading on the European Union ETS for about $80 a ton. That's more than twice what it was two years ago, and it's up 14% so far this year. The World Bank says carbon credits could go over $100 a ton by the end of the decade, so getting CO2 credits is turning out to be a pretty good investment. And it doesn't just have to be for cars. The concept could be applied to other things, like getting a new furnace or refrigerator or any other appliance that's more energy efficient. Cap-and-trade markets are still in their infancy. They need oversight and verification, which is proof that you actually reduced your carbon footprint. But as the SO2 example with the utility shows, trading emissions is one of the fastest ways of slashing pollution. I really like the idea of using a market-based approach instead of regulatory diktat. And earning carbon credits for buying a more efficient car would instantly push up sales. You watch. If we give people the opportunity to make more money by slashing their carbon footprint, there's going to be an Oklahoma land rush to cut CO2 emissions, even by people who think that climate change is a hoax.